We are pleased to welcome you within the unique festival, Different Ever After. The festival offers a great place to discuss how differently and amazingly our society and planet are changing and which role we play in the big game. Добрый вечер, дамы и господа. Меня зовут Константин, и для меня огромная радость вести сегодня предпоследний день онлайн-фестиваля, который организовала для нас посольство Великобритании в Москве и ведущая российская просветительская медиа «Теории и практики». Фестиваль называется «Different Ever After». Он о том, как поменялся сильно за 2020 год наш мир и как мы должны трансформировать себя, чтобы подготовиться к будущему. И сейчас начнется очень интересная встреча с потрясающим спикером, с профессором, который нам расскажет действительно о самом актуальном вопросе для каждого человека, кто живет сейчас на планете Земля. Мы перейдем к научной дискуссии, но до этого я хотел сказать, что онлайн-фестиваль предполагает то, что мы можем участвовать в этом обсуждении. И, во-первых, чтобы вам было комфортно слушать, обсуждение будет на английском языке, мы хотели вам предложить, если необходимо, перейти на русский язык. Итак, если вы смотрите и работаете сейчас с, с своим компьютером, с лэптопом, то для того, чтобы включить перевод, нам необходимо на нижней панели нажать изображение глобуса и там, собственно, выбрать переход на русский язык. Если вы работаете с смартфона, с гаджета, то тогда на нижней панели надо будет нажать три точки и в появившемся списке выбрать слово «перевод». Сейчас я уже перевожу внимание и перевожу, собственно, слово на модераторы этой дискуссии. И еще раз хотел напомнить о том, что вы можете также в ней участвовать, просто отправив свои вопросы. После модерации они будут переданы, собственно, тому человеку, кто и будет сейчас вести эту интереснейшую дискуссию. Как вы знаете, заявленная тема — это «По следам COVID-19» или «Зачем исследовать геном вируса?» спикером. Организаторы выбрали уникального человека. Это профессор Томас Конор, биолог, исследующий геномы, возбудителей болезней и биоинформатик. А модерировать беседу будет научный обозреватель сайта Тайга Инфо Илья Кабанов. Илья, вам слово. Thank you, Константин. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session. During the Different Ever After Festival, we talk a lot about many ways in which this pandemic influenced culture, business, science, society, and our life in general. Now it's time to look at the virus itself. This year, as a part of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK, a national collaboration of over 70 organizations across government, academia, and healthcare have come together to use genomics, the science of studying genomes, to fight the novel coronavirus. During today's lecture, we will learn how scientists use cutting-edge technologies to investigate and understand the virus. We will have a lecture for about 30 minutes, and then there will be time for your questions. Please submit them in the chat window or in the comment section. And now let me introduce our speaker for today, Professor Thomas Conner, who works at Cardiff University. He's a pathogen genome biologist interested in understanding genetic variation across microbial populations and the translation of genomics research into clinical practice. He has published numerous high-profile publications in journals like Science, Nature, and Cell. In the past month, he has developed the genomics program for COVID-19 sequencing. Thanks to his work, Wales sequenced more COVID-19 genomes than any other country in the world other than England and the United States. Together with Professor Connor, we will examine what happened early on in the pandemic, how is the virus changing, and how is it becoming more transmissible. We will also get a sense of how scientists can track the virus on a local level and use this to fight the pandemic in hospitals and our communities. Hello, Thomas. It's great to have you here with us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm, I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. Yeah. How, how, by the way, how, how, are you all there? how are you there? How's lockdown going for you? Lockdown's going all right. Um, we have uh, we have two young children here, so we we suffer the same thing a, a lot of families suffer, which is that you know inability to go out means you, you have two small children who are um, uh, quite what we call say stir crazy. 
um, so they're stuck inside and, and they, they, they want to get out and run around and um, and we're, 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 we're in here and, and, and not able to do very much but the important thing about um, about lockdown about that, that process that's been put in place is that's um, that's to enable the authorities to have a bit of a break to maybe slow down transmission of the virus um, and in so doing we can get better control over what's happening and um, and, and and potentially produce better outcomes for everybody so um, so the lockdown is, is is challenging as a parent but um, but also we, we you know I think collectively people understand that it's perhaps necessary to try and bring those rates down here sure yeah. uh, could you please start the slideshow so we could see your presentation in the full screen mode absolutely great thank you very much and so it, it's a real pleasure to be here and thank you for the introduction um, I'm going to share with you today um, some of the work that we've been doing and I'm going to introduce a bit about genomics um, and about the science of genomes I'm going to introduce a bit about some of the work that we're, that we're undertaking um, uh, in Wales and in the UK and I'm also going to include a little bit of hard science so a few graphs and some data that we've got um, that we're using as part of our um, COVID-19 pandemic response. And so I just want to start with some acknowledgements. So the work that I'm, I'm, that I'm going to be sharing with you is um, from this thing called the COG UK Consortium. And this is a consortium that includes over 450 researchers from across the UK. Um, and that includes um, uh, people from uh, the healthcare system, academics, and people from government agencies as well. And so this is an enormous national effort, uh, which is um, really producing some incredible outcomes. So we, we formed the consortium in March, and what I'm gonna be sharing with you uh, today is, is, is some of those outputs um, over the last uh, few months. So I just wanted to start with a, a couple of bits of key information. So um, the uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, conspiracy theories, a lot of um, uh, reporting about COVID-19 and there are just a few things that I wanted to cover off before we begin. So the first thing is that um, we've been doing a lot of work on the genomics of this, this organism and uh, there's been some suggestion that the virus is man-made and we can say quite clearly from the genomic data that the virus is not man-made and this appears very much to be a species jump where the virus has been in a different species uh, and it has jumped into humans where it's able to cause disease and there's lots of history of diseases being able to do this um, and, and so we, we are relatively uh, clear that, that SARS-CoV-2 is not man-made. Also um, I'm going to talk to you about variants, about um, uh, changes within the population of the virus uh, during this talk but I just want to emphasize that there's only one strain of SARS-CoV-2 um, and this strain emerged into humans somewhere between October and December last year. Um, and that strain, uh, that, 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 that virus has been gaining mutations, but in, in, in absolute terms compared to other viruses is actually still quite similar to that original strain that jumped the species barrier. Um, and the third thing is, I'm also gonna talk to you today about um, changes in the virus. And there's a lot of things in the news about the idea that as the virus uh, lasts longer, as it, as, it, as it sticks around the human population, it will become less severe. And I just wanna say there's no guarantee of that. The virus will evolve to transmit itself. And whether that causes severe disease or benign disease, um, that's almost immaterial. Uh, the key thing for the virus is its own transmission. And then the last thing to emphasize is that the best way to deal with SARS-CoV-2 is to use science. And that uh, use of science to identify um, the best response and to understand the virus is absolutely critical to our pandemic response. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm here. And hopefully this talk will give you a bit of an introduction into um, how we are using uh, the science to help inform the pandemic response. So, what is genomics? Genomics is very simply the branch of biology that's concerned with studying genomes. And so uh, you might be wondering, what is a genome? Well, a genome is effectively the blueprint that contains all the instructions that you would require 
to build and run an organism. Virtually every cell, every virus particle, every bacteria in the world contains a blueprint. And that blueprint is written in uh, molecules called RNA or DNA. And that blueprint has all the information about how to build the cell in which it's found and also has effectively the operating system for that cell that tells the cell how to run. And so genomics is the idea that we can, by studying that blueprint, gain an understanding of how the organism itself functions. And that's what we're effectively doing. And so this is where the analogy to Star Trek comes in. So that blueprint um, inside cells is written in what we call nucleic acids, and those are DNA and RNA. And so they are chemicals, effectively, um, that encode information. And we can use that text, that language within that blueprint to examine organisms of interest. And the Star Trek bit is how we go from those chemicals to A, T, G, and C. Um, and the way we do that, well, we use a thing called a sequencing instrument. So a sequencing instrument is a device that we can jet um, the nucleic acids from a sample into. And that device will then take that chemical and work out what the genome sequence of that sample is. And you can see here on the screen um, a picture of a um, uh, one of my colleagues with a pipette and what she is doing is she is loading DNA onto a sequencing instrument and that sequencing instrument is called an Oxford nanopore instrument and it's about the size of a stapler uh, an office stapler so it's really small it plugs into a laptop and when you hit go um, it starts taking the chemicals that have been loaded in the DNA and reading off the information from that genome. And what you can see on the right um, uh, of, of the, the screen as you look at it um, is the output that we get from that. So as sequence reads are produced, um, they are um, mapped, they are, it's identified which part of the genome they come from, and we can do real-time analysis on that data as it's generated. So this means that you can actually, with this system, um, analyze genome sequence coming off of a nanopore sequencer in minutes uh, from loading that sample. And this type of approach, there's lots of range of sizes of instruments. So you go from a nanopore, which is the size of an office stapler, up to instruments like ANOVASEQ, which are the size of a washing machine. Um, and they can handle different numbers of samples in a single go. Um, but the bottom line with this is that this information um, can be generated very quickly. Um, we use this type of approach for lots of other organisms as well. And we can answer lots of interesting questions about those organisms. So for COVID-19, we're using sequencing to study the evolution of the whole virus. We're looking at um, how things are changing in individual bits of the virus. Um, so bits which relate to say, the ability of the virus to transmit or the uh, parts of the virus that might produce an immune response. And then we're combining our data set, so all of the many thousands of viruses that we're sequencing uh, with data sets around the world to actually track how the virus is moving around the planet. Um, and we can, we can work at a range of levels, so we can look at um, around the planet, we can look at within a country or even within a hospital ward. Um, and to date, just in the UK, we've sequenced over 85,000 um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomes, which is more than the rest of the world combined. Um, just to give you a little bit of context of the sort of scale of the project within the UK. And so how's this possible? Well, um, we're interested in how organisms change over time, which very loosely is how they evolve. And what happens when a a pathogen infects you, what happens when the virus infects you, is a small number of the, the pathogens, so a small number of the viruses get into you, 
Um, they then invade your cells, they replicate, they increase themselves in number, and it's your body's response and the damage that they do as they replicate which produces symptoms. Um, and what's really important is that that process involves a small number of viruses copying themselves to create a very large number of viruses. And that's important because as that, in, that copying is happening, what the virus is having to do is to copy its genome, copy its blueprint many, many times. And the best way to think of that as an analogy is to think of what happens with a photocopier. So if you take a document and copy it on a photocopier, and then you take the copy that you've produced, put that back in and copy that, and do that over and over and over again, you will start to get errors creeping in. You might get smudges or lines on that copy. And the same is true of the virus genome. As the virus genome is copied over and over again, little errors, little changes are introduced. They don't change the overall document, but they might change parts of it. Um, and that's exactly what we see. And just like a photocopied copy, sometimes you might get a really big change that means you can't read the document anymore. Um, and in a virus, you can get changes that mean the virus is broken and won't go on to cause infections. Um, other times, some of those changes might improve that virus um, and make it work a bit better. And those changes, those little differences that happen, are called mutations. Um, and if a change, if a mutation is advantageous, then that may lead to the virus carrying that particular change to increase in frequency, so to infect more people or to infect people more quickly compared to other viruses in the population. Um, and what's really important to note is that overriding all of this is the fact that even though the virus is changing, what's really important in terms of transmission is the human population, is the network of contacts, is how people interact and how people behave. And most pathogens, especially respiratory pathogens like COVID-19, thrive off human behavior and human interactions. Um, and so that's what we're, we're seeing with COVID-19. And we can look at those changes and we can do all sorts of things. So um, as we start to get possible treatments, we can look at the genomics to identify if the virus might be resistant to those treatments. We can look at um, whether changes in the virus might affect the vaccines that are being produced. Um, and we can also use those mutations to track outbreaks and to help support outbreak response. So where I'm from, so I work in the NHS and at Cardiff University, and the NHS is a single national healthcare system, which is free at the point of use. And the organisation I work in is called Public Health Wales. And Public Health Wales runs the diagnostic labs and also um, coordinates the uh, uh, pandemic response uh, for the country of Wales. So uh, 3.25 million people and Public Health Wales um, is, is, is really responsible for diagnostics and for, for the, the, the outbreak response uh, in the country. Um, we have lots of other genomic services that we provide. So we support um, uh, outbreak response for superbugs. Um, we work on things like tuberculosis um, and we also work on viruses like influenza and HIV. And all of our work to date um, and it has been about building these services and running these services, but we've always done it in a way where we wanted to be prepared for a pandemic and able to help in that in that circumstance. And um, and what's happened is we've been able to very rapidly retool and retask to support the pandemic response as well as everything else that we do in Wales. So what are we doing? So we're sequencing every available Welsh COVID nineteen case. And then we're looking for important changes, we're tracking the spread of the virus, and we're looking at outbreaks. And those are the things that I'm going to share with you just now as some of what we've been doing. So this is a graph of cases in the UK. And what we do is very much like a detective where 
we're looking for information from the genome sequence and then we're tying that together with other sources of information to understand or answer particular questions about the virus that we're interested in. And this is just a graph showing um, case numbers in the UK and it emphasizes the fact that depending on where you are in the pandemic, you have different questions that you want to ask. And so early on, our question is very much, how did COVID-19 establish itself in the UK? And then after that, the question is, is it becoming more transmissible? Are there changes happening to the virus that we should care about? And then when we get to a low incidence and we've not got very many cases, uh, the key question is, how can we use this, in, this data that we're generating to fight local outbreaks and support efforts to control the virus? And so I'm going to give you an example that covers each of those three questions um, of what we're doing. So if we start with the first question, um, we've got a population with a set of individuals who are infected. Um, and the healthcare service will see a series of infections in the population. Now, each one of those cases is going to be part of what we call a transmission chain. They would have got it from somebody else. But what we then really want to know is, well, where have those cases come from? And using genomics, we can take those samples, those cases, we can classify them into groups and then we can take that information and look at genome sequences from around the world and start to identify where the case has come from originally, where the index case has come from. And so we can start to understand how it is that the, um, the, virus, uh, the viruses that we see in our population um, have gotten there and where they've come from. And effectively what we do is we build family trees of viruses. So we take viruses from individuals who are infected and we use the genome sequence data to build a family tree of the virus. And so um, within the colored box here, you can see a set of genomes as a schematic. Um, and what we're using genomics to do is to work out how they are related to one another. Um, and by doing that, we can go back to work out um, who the common ancestor of a group of samples is. Um, and from that, we can work out where that case uh, or where that cluster might have come from. And the thing to remember is in a pandemic, um, there's never a thing, uh, there's never a, 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 a patient zero in a country. Um, you are almost certain to have many introductions into a country from different locations and then you will get local outbreaks and local spread. And so one of our challenges is to um, deconvolute that from the, um, from the data um, and to um, be able to really dig into exactly where um, these um, uh, cases have come from. So in the UK, um, we were able to do this and we were able to look at um, the number of virus family trees effectively um, within the country. So this gives us an idea of how many times the virus was introduced. Um, and we can also track um, how big those clusters got. And so what we found was that we could identify over a thousand times where the virus had been introduced into the UK. And we could also identify that um, uh, those cases where um, uh, those introductions were earlier, were before lockdown measures that happened here in March, um, they produced much bigger um, family trees, much bigger clusters of cases than those that were later on. And so that's useful because the first thing is it tells us that the control measures worked, that lockdown worked to stop transmission. Um, but it also tells us potentially that there were many instances of, of, of people carrying the virus and transmitting the virus that weren't necessarily detected um, uh, early on. And so that gives us um, lots of information that we can use um, for our future planning. 
But then the question comes, well, if you've got a thousand introductions, where have they come from? And we've been able to look at um, uh, information like international flights um, and the genome sequence data from other countries to be able to identify that in the UK, Spain and France were the key origins for a lot of the cases in the UK in the first wave. And that's interesting because um, in the UK, there was a lot of media interest about Italy and about the early uh, cases in Italy. Um, but when we looked at the UK, um, actually, most of the introductions uh, weren't from Italy, but they were from Spain and France and happened a bit later. And that's really interesting because it gives us um, a lot of basis for further investigation to understand why is it that, that those introductions were from those places? What were the key dynamics of that? Um, and it really helps with future planning because that then gets rolled into um, things like the modeling that we have for, for, for planning out our worst cases um, for, for, for future. And so that sort of covers a very brief example of how we can use genomics to identify where cases came from. But one of the other questions that really came up was why was it so bad in Europe? And from that, could the virus be changing? So, um, Probably everyone is familiar now with the image um, uh, on the on the left of the coronavirus, um, and those um, uh, red um, uh, structures on the surface of the virus are what's called the spike protein. And this protein, this um, the the shape of those, they look like little crowns, is where the name coronavirus comes from, um, and it's that protein that is really important in getting the virus into cells to cause disease. Um, and what's been observed um, is that there was a change uh, or there was a mutation in the spike protein uh, in about January, um, which over the course of sort of three to four months um, has uh, completely replaced or almost completely replaced the original variant, the original amino acid at that position. Um, and this is a mutation called D614G. Um, and one of the key questions that's been asked is, is this change, has this change, this single mutation, um, had an effect on the ability of the virus to cause disease, which has then meant that it's made it more likely to transmit, made the virus more infectious, um, and from that, um, could that be part of the reason as to why the pandemic was so bad in Europe back in March, but not in places like China? So to answer that question, we looked at our genome sequence data set, um, and we were able to answer two things. So using our sequence data, we were able to demonstrate um, that the G variant, the new variant, um, was indeed more transmissible than the D variant. So there's been laboratory work to look at this to show that the the um, the D variant is 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 uh, sorry the G variant is um, ten to a hundred times uh, more infectious in the lab. So in a laboratory setting, it's able to get into cells much better than the D variant, um, but labs aren't populations um, and animals that you test this on aren't people and so the genome sequence data that we've generated allows us to actually estimate um, the difference in 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 the the the, the two types of variant um, in their ability to cause infections and um, so we see um, we do see an increased ability of G to cause infections compared to D and so that's certainly one of the things that has to be considered going forwards now, there were a lot of questions at the time also about whether this new variant, G, was more serious or produced more serious outcomes compared to D. And again, we were able to examine this using our genome sequence data. And although G is more transmissible, um, there's no difference in severity of outcomes. So uh, if you get a D or a G, um, the, the, the probability of a severe outcome is basically the same. 
Um, so this is on a very broad scale. Uh, this is um, uh, data which is looking at um, around about 25,000 cases from the UK. Um, so it is, 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 is extremely broad in terms of, in terms of its detail. Um, but it tells us a few fundamental things about the virus, which are very important um, for, for future planning and to understand this organism uh, all the more. So that's a national level work. Um, I mentioned that within Public Health Wales, we have our own genomic services um, and we do a lot of local work as well. And to date, we've, we've worked on sort of around about 30 to 35 different outbreaks uh, where we've used genomic data to support outbreak response um, within the NHS. Um, and this is something that we do quite a lot of. Um, and I'm going to show you now an example of where we've used this um, to look at uh, uh, outbreaks uh, in hospitals uh, in Wales. So in about April, um, we'd identified that um, across most of Wales, uh, case numbers were dropping. And one part of Wales, North Wales, this wasn't true. Case numbers were staying high. And we were very interested uh, to understand why that was um, and to work out if there was something that could be done about it. And so we were looking at uh, what we call lineages. So these are the, the family trees of the virus that I mentioned earlier. And we saw that about 60 to 70% of the cases that we were sequencing um, fell into just five or six different uh, lineages, different uh, distinct family trees. Um, and that's interesting because that's the sort of signature which says um, this isn't a sort of widespread community transmission. Um, this is uh, possibly outbreaks um, that we could be looking at. So these numbers are related to a relatively small number of transmission chains potentially. And when we looked into it, we found that a lot of these lineages um, were new, i.e. they hadn't been seen before they'd arrived um, sort of after lockdown started to get eased. Um, and that's interesting because that suggests that they were being imported uh, back into Wales and then you were having these new cases established. And so to look at this, uh, I'm going to focus on one of these, so this lineage that I've, that I've, that I've indicated, um, where my team within the bioinformatics part of Public Health Wales had identified these sets of interesting clusters and then we spoke to our colleagues in North Wales who were working on the outbreaks that were going on there. And what we found was that the, um, the cases from clusters that we were already looking at, so these ones that we had identified, um, were already being examined by colleagues in North Wales as part of outbreak response. And what we found was when we looked at um, all the cases within this outbreak, and this on the side here is a, is a, is a picture of that family tree of these, of these viruses from this particular, from this particular um, uh, 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 lineage. And what we found was that 19 of these cases um, uh, of about 39 um, were all from one hospital. So we'd identified that there was an increase in cases in North Wales in a particular group. And then when we went and looked, we found that those cases were all in a single hospital and they were spread across a number of hospital wards. And this is really useful information because it means that this can then be used by the hospital infection prevention and control team to try and get the outbreak under control. We're also sequencing samples from across the community. And so this is just a little table showing um, uh, rows uh, and each row is a different family tree of the virus. And then you've got community testing. You've got the second column um, is the acute hospital. And then the third column is the community hospital. And what we saw was that there was one particular group, which I've highlighted there, where you had a lot of cases in the acute hospital, as well as some in the community hospital. And other family trees you didn't really see in that, uh, in that acute hospital. And this is very much a signature of hospital transmission rather than community cases ending up in hospital. And so this gave us um, a, a really useful way 
to identify rapidly if we had cases in hospital that needed some sort of follow-up and investigation. And this is just a, um, a figure which is what's used by our clinicians. So this is a timeline. So you have dates along the bottom and you have colored blocks and the colored blocks, um, each one of these is a different patient. Um, and these colored blocks relate to the wards that they're on. Um, and then these sort of uh, green or yellow markers are when um, a COVID-19 test has flagged positive for that patient. So you can use this information and the genomic data that we generate to work out um, how patients have overlapped in terms of their time and space on particular wards. And if they've got virus, which is from the same family tree. Um, and if they have, then uh, and they're overlapping in time and space, then it implies that there's been transmission events um, between them on that ward. And so this is a really powerful tool for us in real time to use genomics to track what's happening um, uh, within hospitals and to deal with outbreaks. And so just in conclusion, um, we've built um, a substantial service uh, in the last few months uh, to examine and investigate SARS-CoV-2 in the UK. Um, we're using that at a whole range of scales uh, from uh, national level surveillance and developing uh, analysis which feeds into national policy um, through to uh, very localized outbreak reporting uh, which allows us to identify uh, where there are groups of transmissions say within a hospital and support um, our colleagues in hospitals to bring those outbreaks under control. Um, it wouldn't be possible without some of these new pieces of technology like the nanopore instrument which is real Star Trek technology um, and at the end of that you then need to do a lot of detective work to tie together these various bits of information um, to actually generate um, uh, results that can be acted on and I think the thing to emphasize is that SARS-CoV-2 isn't over and in a lot of places the pandemic started and there was no intention to use genomics to investigate it. Um, but now genomics is becoming one of the most important tools for understanding the virus. And it's playing a really important role in helping us to beat COVID-19. So um, with that, I will just uh, thank you for your attention and um, now be good for some questions. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I think what this year has shown us is the importance of actually listening to scientists and not to uh, some celebrities or crazy uncles or strange people on Facebook. So thank you again for finding time to explain this important topic in relatively uh, simple terms. Uh, we have a lot of questions for you uh, and about 15 minutes to answer some of them. So I'll start asking uh, these questions. It seems like that COVID-19 caught many governments by surprise in the first months on the, of the pandemic. Didn't they learn anything from previous outbreaks and what can we do to prepare better for the future? So that's a really great point. And my reflection is that for a lot of people in, in higher income countries, for a lot of governments in higher income countries, we've forgotten what an epidemic looks like, what pandemics look like. If you look at places like the UK, I mean, our major causes of death are things like cancer and heart disease. Whereas if you look at places like Bangladesh, for example, their major causes of death are infectious diseases. And so I think what this has really demonstrated is that, you know, we've, we've forgotten the impact of epidemics. And what's certainly true for a lot of places is that um, often funding associated with infectious diseases and pandemic planning has been cut because um, it's not perceived to be sort of an urgent risk. Um, and I think this is, this is, this, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has really changed that. And I think, you know, what, what's, what's been demonstrated is that those countries that have invested in the infrastructure for public health, for containment, for management of outbreaks and, 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 and prevention and control, um, are those that have done best. And so, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of effort required after this is this is all finished to, to be able to identify, you know, what is it that everybody needs to have in place in order to deal with a pandemic in the future. And the other thing to emphasize is that that, you know, 
clearly we live in a, a connected world. Um, there's a there's a there's a, um, a a phrase that's often bandied around that is um, pathogens don't respect borders, and quite clearly on a global level, um, where some countries are doing worse at control, that is going to have an effect on the rest of the world because. Um, we don't just import cases, countries will export cases as well. And so, um, so that it's really a global problem. Uh, what is the biggest challenge in researching and fighting this coronavirus? So I think the, so that the biggest challenge has actually been um, trying to get all the information together to be able to do this. So. The genome sequence data is 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 difficult to to sort of generate. There's a lot of effort and a lot of people required to do that. But the detective work that I mentioned, so combining together information about where patients have been, what they've been doing, you know, um, even things like their age, their sex, you know, where their their home is, that bringing all of that together to analyse it is really really difficult. Um, and um, we've managed to do it in the UK. But a lot of people find there's legal restrictions or there's barriers that, that that mean you can't share information and it's that inability to share information really rapidly which which has a massive impact on um on responding to the outbreak uh, and also being able to do the sort of research that has to be done to really beat this thing and how happy are you with the amount of international mm -hmm. collaboration in researching the coronavirus and what could be done more in this area so the international collaboration is um it's quite sporadic um and it, so it tends to be that that you've got people who've got existing collaborations working together it's not to my mind very structured it's quite ad hoc um and and if you take the example of what we've done in the uk so um there's 70 organizations together in a single collaboration doing sequencing and that was a massive amount of effort to set up but it works really well. And if you think we've sequenced 80 plus thousand genomes, so we sequenced far more genomes than the United States, for example, um, despite the fact they've got much more money and, and many more cases. Um, and the difference is, is, is that sort of collaboration within the UK. Um, and, and, and what that to me demonstrates is that having an approach where people do things sort of locally and without any overarching organization is a really bad way to to sort of get get the, the 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 work done that's required for this. And so, at the moment, most of the international collaboration is is not structured. It's on a sort of a best efforts basis. And um, and and clearly, I mean, like we're focused on the UK because we live here. And and the real challenge is 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 enabling people to carve out time to contribute to the global response rather than just to be focused on their local response as well. And so there's, there's, I think there's, there's, there's a real need for sort of structure in this, and 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 international leadership. And I think maybe um, that's not quite there in the same way that it is in on, on some local levels. Here's another question from the members of our audience: Do you feel personal responsibility to society for the results of your work? Uh, is it stresses you out? Um. So, it doesn't stress me out because it's the job that I do. Um, and everything that we do is done to try and, and yeah, everything that we, everything that I do is done to try and improve the health and the, 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 um, and, and the, uh, and the well-being of the people and patients in Wales. Um, and so there's certainly, um, yeah, I don't feel stressed, but I do feel like I have to, um, work as hard as I can to do as much as I can. Um, there aren't a massive number of people in the world who can do what we're doing here. Um, and so I feel a real responsibility to, to, to do the work that we're doing and, and, to, and to work as hard at that as possible. And so it's been a very hard six months. It's been a massive amount of effort um, uh, and it's been very draining and it's obviously carrying on. Um, but also it's a hugely important thing that we're doing and what we're doing is having a real impact. And so, you know, when we get the messages from um, clinical colleagues or 
um, or from people in government that they really appreciate what we're doing that really helps as well and 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 it, it, it's been it's it's been a it's been an amazing time uh, one of my colleagues said to, said to me early on in the pandemic um, this is what we trained for because th this everything that we we're doing now as part of the pandemic response this is what we do for our careers and this is what we've trained for and so um and so this is you know it, it it's a hugely important moment and, and it's just just hope that you're up to the challenge yeah uh, in your opinion when and how this pandemic will end what are the most likely scenarios so my gut feeling remains that it it the pandemic will will end um effectively once once there's a vaccine available and my suspicion is that it won't be um like polio or smallpox where we have a vaccine and we eradicate the disease my suspicion is that we'll get everyone vaccinated um and then what we'll have is it will still be there but it will become a seasonal coronavirus so we have other seasonal coronaviruses now which are the common cold and don't cause very much of a problem and i have a suspicion that once everyone's been vaccinated against it um we'll be in a position where actually the if you do get sick with it subsequently it won't be very serious and so my suspicion is that's that's the end point is a vaccine which allows it to become um uh, an endemic human coronavirus with a very 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 low fatality rate um and and that that's my gut feeling of 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 of, of what the end end of this looks like and what are the chances uh, chances for the vaccine to uh, be manufactured by the end of this year um so I, i think the end of this year is going to be a little bit challenging um it because the, the the key problem so the, the biggest issue with vaccines is that they can do unintended things so um clearly what we have to be sure of is the vaccine is safe and doesn't produce any unwanted effects uh before it goes into into service and that's why vaccine trials take so long um and so my gut feeling is based on on what's what's been out there i think the first sort of mass vaccinations will probably be in the first half of next year um but that that hopefully means that you know sort of by the end of 2021 um most countries will be getting back to normal um assuming the vax the first vaccines work gotcha uh another question from our viewers i just uh, i'll read it out loud uh thank you so much professor connor i would like to ask if these mutations are spontaneous or not. Mm. Furthermore, can you tell at what replication cycle did the mutation occur? So, um they are spontaneous, so these are these are mutations so the um the, the way the virus copies itself um is potentially error prone. So that that process of replication will introduce errors. Um we can't tell exactly at what point say within a within an individual uh, a particular mutation has occurred um but we certainly can identify the approximate time scales when certain mutations would have occurred so the d614 g mutation um we know happened um probably in late january and we can actually pin down an approximate area where that happened as well um and 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 and, and so that it actually happened relatively early on in the in the overall pandemic Are you interested in COVID-19 patients' genetic susceptibility? So that's not something I'm working on, but we have a um a partner group called Genomic, G uh, which is a um a link to Genomics England, which is our the 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 part of the sort of the, the research structure in the UK that's focused on looking at the human genome. Um and they've been they've been looking at hundreds of thousands of of of, of patients. Um, and trying to identify um genetic variants that might might relate to to, to susceptibilities mm -hmm. and one of the things that we're planning on doing is taking our virus genome sequence and looking at and potentially comparing that then to the host genome sequences that we're seeing to see if there's any um uh, any indication that particular um uh variants in the virus might have an impact um in particular host backgrounds Um so that's a little bit harder to do and it requires quite a lot of samples but 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 we are working with our with our colleagues both in in genomic and also um uh, on the immunology side to look at things like T cell response and B cell response. Uh do you think that some people are genetically more inclined to get uh, more 
a severe form of uh, the coronavirus. So what what's likely to be the case? So, so the, the, the answer is yes, but it, it's probably only a small proportion of the population. Um, so what some of the um, the cases of, of, of younger people dying, especially or having more severe outcomes, it may well be that those are sort of undiagnosed or unrecognized um, uh, genomic uh, factors in the host, in, the, in those individuals, which meant that they were more susceptible to a severe outcome. Um, and, and certainly there've been a few papers coming out on this, although nothing conclusive yet, but, but my suspicion would be that there is, that there, there, you know, it's likely to be as we do more sequencing of the host, we will start to identify some, some particular types where you get more severe outcomes. Um, there's been some very, um, there's been some interesting um, uh, work looking at things like the ABO blood groups as well. And of course, those are genetically encoded. So that could be a very trivial example of where outcomes vary. But it, it, in that case, it, it may well be that those blood groups relate to other factors um, which, which, which have an impact on, on outcomes as well. So, so we'll, anyway, it, that, that's a very much an emerging research area, but I, I would be surprised if there weren't any examples of genetic factors um, causing uh, having predispositions to to more severe outcomes. Is there a way to use genome editing techniques like CRISPR Cas9 to modify the coronavirus genome so it could basically fight itself? Um, so I don't think necessarily fighting itself. Although I do believe there are vaccines that use CRISPR Cas9 technologies. They've they've been built using CRISPR Cas9. So that 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 tech is 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 certainly being used to fight the virus i, I think the um again the, the the use of of um sort of genetically modified organisms to try and do something it, it's potentially more difficult I, I think especially with the virus where the virus is replicating inside cells really what you want to do is make sure that the immune system is properly tooled up to be able to fight the virus and, and that's normally by a vaccine speaking of technology uh, what makes this pandemic different from the previous ones is the amount of technology in the world. For example, we now have the artificial intelligence, machine yeah. learning, and all this stuff. Uh, do you use these uh, instruments in your research? Yep. So, um, so the, um, the the sequence data that comes off of the Nanopore. So the Nanopore actually uses um, um, a neural network as part of its sequencing algorithm. Um, so that's actually used on the laptop that's running to process the data as it comes off. And then we generate um, uh, sort of hundreds of, 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 of gigabytes of data on a single sequencing run. And that then gets pushed onto a supercomputer, um, which we operate. So we, we have a, a, a one in Cardiff and, and one in Birmingham and they're linked. And um, and so we you know we have access to sort of thousands of, of compute cores um, to do the bulk processing for the, for, 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 for the, the analysis. And then for bits of work like the D614G work, the spike protein work, um, that uses a lot of mathematical modeling. And again, that runs on, on um, high performance computing and graphic processing units. So, so um, the, uh, all the results of our work are really powered by very cutting edge computational approaches and a lot of computational hardware, um, uh, which, is, which, is, which is something that we've we, you know, we spent quite a lot of, lot of time building. And how does this coronavirus uh, compares with the previous uh, viruses like Ebola and others in terms of uh, its uh, virulence? So, um, I mean, Ebola is a, is is a is is a sort of the the extreme case in terms of mortality and um, uh, and actually the, the, its ability again to transmit it, it, it it's it, it's very unpleasant. Um, in terms of transmissibility, it's it's probably a bit nastier than things like SARS, the original SARS, um, mainly because it, it actually so so with the original SARS, I think I'm right in saying that it that people don't transmit the virus until they're symptomatic, whereas this you can transmit the virus before you've got symptoms. So that that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to control because people will be transmitting the virus for a period of time before they know they've got it. Um, and 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 so so I mean certainly in terms of of, of sort of impact, um, it's you know you have to go back quite some way to find the global pandemic that has that 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 sort of combination of the ability of the virus to transmit, the difficulty to control it, and the 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 effect on on you know in terms of in terms of uh, lives lost and and really you are going back to sort of influenza pandemics earlier on in the twentieth century really, um, I think before you you get to that sort of scale and and 
because as I say, the thing with Ebola is it's it's it, it's extremely nasty, but in a sense, it's also um, uh, controllable. Whereas because of the nature of this virus, it's not as it's not anywhere near as unpleasant as Ebola, but it is definitely much worse than flu. Um, but it's very easy to transmit it, so that, that that makes it much harder to sort of like keep it contained, as as, as we've discovered. Unfortunately, it's time for my last question. Uh, is there a way to predict where and then the next pandemic hits us and uh, what could be the source of the pathogen? So there isn't a way to predict. Um, and I think that the, the key thing actually is this is this comes back to the question about public health and monitoring is that almost certainly the next pandemic is you know going to be caused by a virus that's currently circulating probably in animals um, at the moment. Um, uh, or circulating in some animals. And so the best way to prevent it is to have all the measures in place so that when it first arrives in the population, when it makes that species jump, you can get a lid on it, you can control it, you can stop it before it manages to spread anywhere. Because if you do that, you've just had an outbreak, you've not had a pandemic. And if you fail at that first step of control, if you don't have those measures in place to really prevent the spread, then what you get is you get exactly what's happened where it, it's spread too far it's in too many countries for us to actually eradicate it just by control measures and so so that's that that so we don't know what we don't know what the next pandemic virus is going to be um but i think we do know what's going to be required to make sure that we can stop that virus actually causing a pandemic when when that species jump does happen great uh thank you so much thomas it was a pleasure to speak with you i think we touched a lot of important topics all right Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions as well. They were really good. Yeah. And thank you for uh, to the UK Embassy in Moscow and here in practice for organizing this amazing festival. And thank you to our translator and sign language interpreter. You've done a great job. And the uh, Different Ever After Festival will continue later tonight. We have one more session for you. And tomorrow there will be a very important discussion about Brexit with the UK ambassador in Russia. It starts at 1 p.m. Moscow time. Try not to miss it. Thank you again. It was a pleasure to spend this uh, hour with you. And now back to you, Konstantin. Please tell us more about the rest of the festival program. Илья, большое спасибо. На самом деле мне вот здесь как раз точно нечего добавить, кроме того, что я лично хочу поблагодарить, как и каждый зритель, уважаемого профессора, профессора Томаса Конора за такое подробное объяснение и за, наверное, максимальную возможную ясность в такой научной лекции в это время, которое нам удалось отвести под важнейшую тему про COVID-19 и про изучение этого вируса. Ну, а следующая наша встреча, которая сегодня состоится в 19.00 по московскому времени, будет посвящена тем, кто узнает все обо всем первыми. Это, конечно, представители средств массовой информации, наши уважаемые журналисты. И мы поговорим о важной теме, какое большое давление сейчас, конечно же, и ответственность на журналистов. И, конечно, еще раз встретимся с удивительными спикерами. Но обо всем вы узнаете уже в 19.00. Со своей стороны также выражаю благодарность за перевод. Здесь моего уровня английского не хватало, и я перешел на перевод на русский язык, чтобы прослушать эту Хорошего, до встречи в 19.00.